Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another session of OLC 4.0. Today is Thursday, November 23rd. This is class number eight. So today we're going to be talking about unit one. And at the end of today's lesson, I'm going to review um, today's class. I'm going to review lessons one and two to make sure we didn't miss anything. Ah, today's the 24th. <laughs> very good, very good. I'm going back in time. So today is November 24th, and we will give a review of lessons one and two, and then starting on Monday, we'll go into lesson three, and we should be able to finish off unit one by the end of next week. So we should be on to uh, unit two the following week. So this is week three. Sorry, week two. Uh, during week three, we will finish off unit two, and we'll probably start week four on unit number two. And then we'll progress from there. And then we'll, we'll break from December 26th to January 5th. So probably we'll have units two, possibly N3, done by then, but for sure unit two. So... Some of the units are a little bit shorter than others, and I spent a lot of time on unit one just to get everybody settled in the chorus. So you can you can always review these when you go back to the lessons, but you know these are the ways you can watch the watch or listen to the class live, and you can you know pause the screen or if you're watching this on YouTube and and jot those down. I will post them on Facebook. I will also send uh, emails reminding you and you can always check in with your learning center if you if you don't have this information it's also in the study guide every day I check the YouTube and I see the views are starting to creep up so that's great so people are watching the videos that's great so I can see that the content is being viewed so if you have any questions just you know send me send me an email give me a call this is how you can submit your work Again, this is all in your outline, your, sorry, your study guide. This, this information can be found by emailing myself, talking to your learning center, re referencing your, your study guide. It's all in there. These are the ways to get in touch with me, you know, or your other WASA teachers. If you're taking other courses, make sure you're reaching out to them, letting them know if you've got any questions. I'd love to hear from you and during my office hours. So these these are also the times when I'm the most responsive on Messenger as well. So I don't really check my Facebook Messenger when I'm not at work. Sometimes I will, but it's pretty rare. So usually when I'm in the office from 9 to 3, that's when I'm checking that Messenger, and that's the best time to jump on there and ask me a question. So please contact me if you haven't already done so. Please read the first 35 pages of Unit 1, and you should co should complete Assignments 1 through 7, and you should be starting to work on Assignments 8 and 9. And, you know, making a plan to get through Unit 1, Lessons 1 and 2. Okay, so we'll jump into today's lesson. We will do our words of the day. We'll look at a headline. Uh, our, our today's punctuation will be commas, which is the most common, so I want to spend a little time on that. And our part of speech will be our interjections, which is probably the least used and most rare part of speech, but it is good to know all nine. So, And then, ah, that's a carryover from yesterday. We will, instead of doing that, we will review, we're going to review lesson Lessons 1 and 2 from Unit 1. So we'll look at all the lessons from, um, we'll look at all the assignments and all of the course material. And we'll know we're successful if we can, uh, oh sorry, we, we, we will learn the nine parts of speech. We'll learn what an interjection is. We'll learn about the proper use of a comma. And we will review the assignments in Unit 1. Lessons 1 and 2. And we'll know we're successful if we can understand the definition. Whoops. 
Look at me. Not prepositions. That was my initial thought. And I thought, well, we already covered those in a different lesson and might come back to them, but we're going to we're going to understand the definition of a pr interjection. We're going to learn how to use commas properly. And you'll know you're successful if you've done that. You've done that and you have made a plan for completing all of the assignments listed in Unit 1, Lessons 1 and 2. And if you've already completed all those assignments, then you're ahead of the game and you are successful. But for those of you who haven't, you will be successful if you just simply make a plan. And that could just be a schedule or an outline of when you want to tackle those assignments. So today's uh, words of the day, this is your hint. We've got a... A guy out here fishing with a very large fish in his hands, which looks to be a massive pike or more likely a a musky. Okay, so we're we're gonna look at the word in Anishinaabemowin and the word in English. Okay, so um, so we've got you know ma mashkanuje, which is uh, of course in English we we call that a muskalunge or more commonly known as a musky. This is what we call a loan word. A loan word is when one language, in this case English, is borrowing a word from a different language. Okay, so um, muskies were around for, you know, millions, thousands of years, and then when Europeans came here, um, to North America, they started naming things. And more often than not, they would just put their own name on it. They would just put their own stamp on it. But once in a while, they would take the word that the indigenous people of the country um, were using already. And sometimes they would just take the word, like, like moose, for example, it just became moose. The spelling's a bit different. Uh, Muscalunge got a little bit altered. Um, this looks like a French word to me. But we, we know it as musky. And, you know, after I did a bit of research, I found a, uh, an interesting article that talked about the origins of the word. So um, we've got genuje, which is, um, can be, um, fr from what I read, and of course, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't speak the language, but I'm just going on what I find online and in the, in the books that I have on my shelf, but that... That word genuje could mean pike or it could just mean fish. In general, it doesn't have to be a pike, but sometimes it refers to a pike. And then uh, manadad is ugly. And so when you combine those two words, you know, um, you've, you've got the word ugly, which is, of course, an adjective, a describing word. And the adjective describes this noun, genuje, fish or pike. So you combine them together and you literally get ugly pike. Mashkanuje, right there. So that's what you get. So a lot of words in Anishinaabemowin, Ojibwe, a lot of words in English are two words that at one point were separate and then they just kind of get jammed together. Sort of like the word um, tomorrow, which used to be to the morrow or the morning, right? Or the next day, right? And that just got shortened into tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. But it used to be three words. So, of course, that word uh, pike in English, it's got a couple of meanings. It means any of several large, slender, voracious. That's a great adjective. Freshwater fishes of the genus Esox, which is, you know, just like the, the scientific classification, having a long, flat snout. A pike is also a shafted weapon, having a pointed head formerly used by infantry, so foot soldiers. A sharply pointed projection or spike, or the pointed end of anything, as of an arrow or a spear. There's a great picture of a pike right there, up close, and I, and I found a picture, you know, this is, the, this is the weapon pike, and this is, of course, the fish. And you can see that uh, you can see that kind of pattern, that kind of uh, that pattern, especially in this one right here. You can see you can see the similarities between 
you know, this that that pike up top there definitely looks like the a fish opening its mouth, right? So um, you can see how when when, when Europeans uh, saw a pike for the first time, they were like, oh, okay, this reminds me of uh, of the weapon, the pike. All right, so today's punctuation, we're going to be talking about commas. And we use commas for many reasons in our writing. We, they set up introductory phrases. They separate items in a list. They add information about nouns and set up quotations, etc. So, you know, I've used the commas here in this example um, um, to set up an item in a list. I've also used the colon, right? I've used the colon to set up my list. And I'm using my comma to uh, separate items in my list. So you can see the, the, uh, the punctuation at work, okay? And of course the period to end a sentence. All right, so an introductory phrase. What do we mean when we talk about an introductory phrase? And how do we get rid of that? That's bugging me. I don't want that there anymore. There we go. Introductory phrases are words. So an introductory phrase, you know, an introduction usually happens when you meet someone for the first time. And, it, you know, that word intro means, you know, before the main part, right? So an introductory, introductory phrase is a group of words that sets up the main part of the sentence. So it's setting up something for the reader. Many introductory phrases include prepositions, such as after, during, while, etc. So here's a phrase right here. After we arrived in Winnipeg, whoops, I kind of blocked out the word Winnipeg. So after we arrived in Winnipeg, comma, we stopped at Tim Hortons for a meal and checked into our hotel. Now usually with an introductory phrase, you can, you can reverse it and you can just sort of block it off. And let's say if we block off this and we instead said, we stopped at Tim Hortons for a meal and checked into our hotel after we arrived in Winnipeg. We could say that and we wouldn't need the comma. But when the introductory phrase comes first like that, with the word after, you put the comma. While many people said the restaurant was terrible, comma, my wife and I really enjoyed our meal. During the construction of the house, comma, the contractor lost most of his employees because they weren't being paid. So it sort of gives the reader one thing to keep in their mind. So you know, during the construction of the house, so, you know, picture a house, picture it being constructed. Okay, so while that's happening, this happened, right? So that's how an introductory phrase operates. Sometimes the introductory phrase can just be one or two words, but we still use a comma as these words perform the same function of setting up the main part of the sentence. So in this case, I've got however, for example, and unfortunately. So my little brother is struggling to learn how to ride a bike. However, comma, he keeps trying and gets better every day. Now, of course, I've got a period here. I could swap that period in for a semicolon because I have two independent clauses, right? So he keeps trying and gets better every day. Could stand alone as its own sentence. Um, but in this case, it doesn't. So I, I could have used a semicolon there, but I chose not to. For example, comma, this morning he scraped his knee after a bad fall and kept riding for another 20 minutes. Unfortunately, comma, there is too much rain in the forecast and we have to cancel the baseball game. Okay, so that's, that's how we, we use those introductory phrases. And and if and it's and it's supposed to when you when you read it out loud, the comma tells you to pause for a half second before you go on. But at any time you see like an introductory phrase that uses these one words or uses these prepositions like after, during, while, before, you need a comma to separate them. 
a positive noun phrase. So don't let that fancy language fool you or intimidate you. An a positive noun phrase. It's just a group of words that provides more information about a noun. All right. So you introduce a noun, and then in this case, the commas work a lot like brackets, in the sense that you need, if it's in the middle of the word, you need two sets of them. You, you need one at the start, one at the end. So Connor McDavid, comma, the NHL's current point leader, comma, is the captain of the Edmonton Oilers. So I could take this part out and just simply say Connor McDavid is the captain of the Edmonton Oilers, because that's a that's a true statement. But if I want to add information about Connor McDavid, I can either put it in brackets or I can put it in commas, okay? In this case, I decided to put it in commas. My sister wants to get a tattoo of Artemis, the Greek goddess of hunting. So sometimes the, the A positive noun phrase comes at the end. And that's when I'm explaining who Artemis is, right? So I put a comma and then I explain who Artemis is. Again, that could have been in brackets, right? I could, have, I could have done that, but I didn't. In this case, I decided to use my commas. Last example, a bull moose, the biggest they had seen all weekend, stepped into the road just as they were packing for home. So again, the rule is if you can, if you can cross it out, a bull moose stepped into the road just as they were packing for home. That could be a sentence on its own, but I wanted to give the reader some additional information about that bull moose, and that's my additional information. It was the biggest one they had seen all weekend. All right, so that's how that works. We also use commas when we separate independent clauses. So when we, when we, when we, um, sorry, when we have separate independent clauses and we use the comma to connect them, we join them with our coordinating conjunction, right? So our conjunctions in purple here, our conjunctions are our connectors. That's why we have conjunctions. They are connectors. They put two things together. And they're, they're, they're connectors but they're special connectors, right? And they, and, they, and, they, and they tell a relationship between two different things. So in the first example, there weren't any tickets available for the concert, so we decided to check out a different show, right? So it's because this happened, this happened. So there's a relationship, right? So, you know, that's how so works. Um, I invited my brother to the birthday party, but he got a flat tire on his way into town. So, you know, the word but it kind of works the same way as however, or, you know, it's like this happened, but that happened. So that other thing couldn't happen, right? So, and the last example was the final exam was known to be challenging, comma, yet all of the students received at least 70% or higher. Now, that needs to be a complete sentence. All of the students received at least 70% or higher. That's a complete sentence. Um, he got a flat tire on his way into town. That's a complete sentence. We decided to check out a different show. That's a complete sentence. And everything before it is a complete sentence. But the word so comes in and it joins them together. And, and I've used the example of like the Lego pieces or like, you know, if you're building furniture or building anything, there's certain pieces have to go together. So the order goes comma number one conjunction comes right after and then the rest of the sentence right so you put a comma you put the conjunction and then you do the rest of the sentence and if you do that your sentence is grammatically correct here is today's headline if you if you've been listening to the radio or have any uh, soccer fans on your uh, social media feeds you will probably heard a lot about the world cup i don't really watch soccer but I've, I've definitely been hearing lots about it the last couple of days. So in this headline from the Globe and Mail, we've got Japan scores two late goals to pick, up a, to pick up stunning win over Germany at World Cup. Late goals by substitutes Ritsu Doan and Takuma Asano 
gave Japan an incredible 2-1 to -one comeback victory over Germany in the World Cup on Wednesday in another emotional fill-up for Asian soccer after Saudi Arabia's shock win over Argentina. I'm not even sure what that word means, Philip. <laughs> I'll have to look that one up. So there's my headline with all of the parts of speech broken down. I've got nouns in blue, verbs in green, adjectives in orange, prepositions in red. And we'll break that down like we usually do. So Japan is, of course, a proper noun. We always capitalize it, capital J, Japan. They are also the subject of my sentence, right? The subject of the sentence is what the sentence is primarily about, the number one thing the sentence is about. And the predicate is what happens to that subject or what that subject did. In this case, they scored two late goals, all right? So scored is what they did. Now, yesterday we were talking about adjectives and how adjectives can sometimes describe two, um, sometimes adjectives can describe um, a noun, but sometimes more than one adjective can describe a noun. So in this case, we have two late goals. So the goals were late which means they happened late in the game, not early. And two tells us how many. So they're both adjectives, and there was two of, there was, there's two of them. One of them tells us there's two goals. One of them tells us what time, approximately, they were scored during the game. Two is a preposition. Um, it tells us um, what happened. So two... They pick, they pick up. The word up modifies this verb, right? You normally don't pick down, but you know, when you pick up something, the, the word up is modifying that word. Um, they picked up a win, right? So win can be a verb. So, you know, I went out there and I won the game. That's a verb. But a win is a thing also. It's a win. They got, they got a win. So win is a noun, but it wasn't just any old win. It was a stunning, stunning win, right? So the word, the word stunning modifies the word win. Over, a relationship word. Germany, another proper noun, right? Capital G, Germany. At the World Cup, another proper noun. All right, period. And that's our sentence, broken down with all our parts of speech in it. So today's part of speech that we'll look at in a, a bit of a closer look is an interjection. So an interjection is a big name for a short word. They are short exclamations such as O oh or A. Ah, or they're like, um, sometimes you can call them interruptions. So if two people are having a conversation, you can interject by putting your words in there, right? So when you interject, you interrupt, right? It, it's sort of like a similar meaning as that. So that's, that's literally what an interjection is. So it, it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's an exclamation, and, and that's why it has the exclamation point on the end of it, but not always, as we'll see in a second. Interjections are used more commonly in speech than writing. So interjections are informal, so you normally wouldn't use them in an essay for, your, for a class assignment. You wouldn't really use them in a cover letter or a resume or a proposal or something formal where you're trying to impress people, you know. Uh, an interjection is usually used in more casual, informal writing, emails, text messages, and again, it's, it's something that we use in speech when we talk a lot more than we use it in writing. But it has its place in writing. You see it a lot in fiction, for example. Especially when the writer is trying to write the same way that people talk in real life. 
So examples of it in a sentence are as follows, and there's a quick note there that they're often followed by an exclamation point, but not always. So, ouch, that really hurts. This kind of, this is kind of um, awkward. That's when the interjection is more like an interruption. It's more like an interruption, and, and you don't need the exclamation point. Ah, she said, I remember where I left my keys. So in these two cases, they are exclamations. But they're kind of like a little odd part of speech that doesn't really fit anywhere else. They're not nouns, they're not things, they're not actions, so they're but they are their own part of speech, the nine parts of speech. And I think we've covered most of those nine parts of speech, but we will continue to look at them as the, as the chorus goes on. All right, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about assignment nine, because we didn't really have a chance to finish it completely. And then we'll just do a quick review of everything in unit one, uh, lessons one and two, to make sure that everybody's on board and I haven't missed anything that should have been covered in those two courses. So unit nine, sorry, uh, unit one, lesson two, assignment nine is a journal entry. And it's about learning. And it's about your own learning and being aware of how you learn, right? So a really fancy word for this would be meta cognition. Always important to be learning new words, okay? So, uh, cognition is just a fancy word for thinking. And the word meta is about. Right? So, metafiction is fiction about fiction. Uh, metadata is, is information about other information. So if you, um, if you go on Rotten Tomatoes um, and you're looking up reviews for a movie, they have a thing called a meta score, and that's a score about a score, and that's when they average out a whole bunch of reviews for a movie, right? So that word meta just means about. So metacognition is, is basically like thinking about your own thinking. It's, it's trying to... Think about the ways that you learn. Think about the ways that your brain operates. And it's a, it's a very useful um, strategy for life in general. It, it's a very useful strategy for being a student. You don't just simply read the course material, do the assignments once in a while. It's good to slow things down and think about the ways that you learn and try to find ways that you can do it better. And this applies to many aspects in life, whether you're a parent, uh, you're in a relationship with somebody, you're an athlete, you're a hunter, you're a craftsman, you're an artist, right? You're engaged in some kind of activity. And then if you just do it all the time and you never think about it and never write it down and never reflect upon it, you're not going to learn. And that might not be important to you, and it may not matter, but if you want to get better at it, and if it's important to you to get better at it, then you have to take the time to do some thinking, do some metacognition, okay? And that's what this assignment's all about. And you do that by writing three different paragraphs. Sometimes in this, sometimes in this course, we give you the option of writing about what you want to write about. For this assignment, oh, excuse me, it's very specific. You have to write three paragraphs, and each paragraph is about something very specific. Paragraph one is about you being an active participant in your own learning. You know, uh, I, uh, either, an, either an active or an inactive, right? So part of this assignment is about where you are right now, being honest, telling the truth about where you are right now. And part of the assignment is talking about how you could change that, right? 
that's the whole point of reflection. You don't just reflect upon your life and be like, well, this stuff happened. That's the way it is. I guess I can't change it. Like, you know, that's a very depressing prospect, right? It's like, no, it's like these things happened. I liked these parts of it. I didn't like these parts. I want the good things to keep happening and I want the bad things to change. And here's my plan to do that. And I may be successful. I may only change a little bit of it, but I'm going to do my best to, you know, make the good parts better and make the bad parts, you know, a little less bad and, you know, may, make, make some bad things work in my favor. Paragraph two, you're going to talk about improving your literacy skills. So your, li your ability to read, to write, to understand, to comprehend, to communicate. There's all kinds of literacy skills, right? How can you improve them? And step three is going to be your willingness to reflect and learn from your mistakes, which is very hard to do. Not easy. So, if you haven't watched class number seven, I need you to go back and watch that because I, I gave everybody some very specific instructions for step one, two, and three of the writing process. So step one, we plan. Step two, we write, we generate ideas. Step three, we do some revision. So revision is big picture stuff. Revision is planning out paragraphs. Revision is giving a title to our work. So revision is the big picture, is when we zoom out and we can see the whole thing. We can see all of it. Editing, step number four, is where we zoom in on one word, one paragraph, one sentence. Editing is usually done on a sentence by sentence level. Some writers have been known to do that tactic where they'll write a whole bunch of words and they'll write a whole bunch of paragraphs and then what they'll do is they'll break their writing up into individual sentences. Now this only works if you've got a word processor or if you're working in a digital copy. Um, but if, if, if you're writing in pen and pad, you might want to try this. And you may want to write your sentences down um, individually and not and not jump and not and not jumble them all together or not jumble them but not um, not fit them all together you might want to write a sentence leave a space write a sentence leave a space and then you can see your writing sentence by sentence and then you can go in and start editing them and making changes to them just an example something you might want to try so when we edit these are the four steps I'd like you to try I want you to read your rough copy out loud, either to yourself or someone else. Make note of any mistakes or things you want to change. Uh, for bonus marks, you could record yourself. You know, record yourself on a device, on a phone, a computer. If you've got like an old school tape recorder, do that. Record yourself on a device and listen to yourself talking. And for most people, that's going to be a painful exercise. It's going to be awkward. But uh, like a lot of things, once you get in the habit of doing it, it really helps. I've written a lot of short stories um, in my life, a lot of poetry. Um, wrote a book once many years ago, and I use this technique all the time. I would read it out loud, and as I read it out loud, I would catch so many mistakes because the human brain, we are really good at scanning. We're, the human brain is very good at scanning for things and looking for, and then what we do is we fill in the blanks. We fill in the missing words. We, we, we correct the spelling mistakes, right? It's very easy to miss it. So when the human brain looks at words, it doesn't go letter by letter it actually looks at the combination of the letters and it rearranges them in, it, in its head and it makes sense of it, right? So it, like, it looks for patterns, right? And it, it likes to fill in the blanks and make guesses for us. But when you read it out loud, you will hear the mistakes and you will hear the missing words, right? So it, it's really useful. I really recommend this, this idea. So I'm hoping you can try that. 
Number two, ask somebody else to read your paragraphs and ask them to look for any errors. Really important. If you've got somebody in your life who can do this for you, it's going to be huge for you. So ask them to read your paragraphs and ask them to look for any errors, right? So I've, I've often heard about the, um, the, the, the comparison to dreams. So if you have a dream and, and the dream is really important to you, sometimes you go to explain that dream and it could be someone who's really important to you, like your wife, your husband, your kids, and you explain the dream and they get bored. And they get bored because they didn't have the dream and the dream is boring to them and you're not giving them detail and they don't really care, right? So sometimes when you're writing, it all makes sense in your head and when you write it down, all that missing information is sort of like in your head. But when you give the piece of paper to your friend, all they have is your words. They don't have all of the background information. They don't have the inspiration for the story. They don't, uh, like if you, it, like for assignment two, growing up in your community, you've got this whole memory bank of memories of you growing up in your community and what it felt like to be you. You, you have like, you know, this immense amount of information in your brain. But then when you write this little two paragraph thing, we're just getting this tiny little sliver of who you are. And that's what makes writing so challenging, right? But when you give someone else your writing and they read it, they're gonna come back to you and hopefully they're gonna ask you some questions and they're gonna give you some ways for you to make it better, so. And then look for errors and I'm gonna say ways to improve. So give them the writing and say, hey, how can I make this better, right? Step number three, look up any words in a dictionary to make sure you haven't misspelled anything. So if any of, the, any, if any of those words kind of give you a second thought, if you have any kind of hesitation, then please look them up in a dictionary and make sure you haven't misspelled any words. And then um, maybe another thing you should do is review all punctuation okay anytime you you've used punctuation look at it and say have i used that correctly you know have i used my comma correctly have i used my semicolon correctly have i used my brackets right should i have a period here should i be starting a new sentence right so just ask yourself have i used these things correctly so you need to be able to edit your own work. You need to be, the best editor is going to be you. And you're going to become a better editor by learning how to use the parts of speech and learning how to use punctuation and learning how to use grammatical conventions. But you also need an outside ear, an outside person to read stuff for you. And sometimes, it's kind of weird to think about it, but sometimes that second person is you. And one way to get distance from your work is by reading it out loud. And the, the last thing I, I want you to do is to go for a walk and think about your paragraphs. Um, you know, go for a walk or, you know, this could be, or, you know, do something else. Put it down. Just, just walk away from it. Wash the dishes. Take your dog for a walk. Play with your kids. Um, work on that project you got going on in the house, you know, make some art, do some drawing, watch some Netflix, I don't know, do something else. And then when you come back and read what you wrote, make a few more changes, right? So let your brain do some thinking. Our brains love to solve problems when we're not thinking about them, right? I guarantee you when you come back to it a second time or a third time or a fourth time, you're going to see things you didn't see before and you're going to think of things you didn't think of before. You know, uh, last month actually, my, my grandmother passed away, sadly, um, and we, my cousins and I were writing a eulogy for her, and the eulogy was going to be delivered the next day, and I was really stressed out about it, and I didn't like it, and I thought, oh my, oh my goodness, this is this is not going to sound well and I'm not going to honor her legacy and having all these uh, th thoughts of doubt and then I went to bed and I woke up at like five in the morning and I op opened my laptop and it was like 
all these new ideas came to me. It's like my brain had been working on it, and I woke up, and I had all this energy, and I just wrote for two more hours, and it all sort of came together. But I think if I would have pushed myself and stayed up all night, I would have never have done it. Sometimes it's good just to take a break and come back to it. Step five, the publication phase, is the easiest one. That's the one we all like. That's when you just send it over, right? So when we publish in the real world, um, we are sending it off to a, a publication, like a newspaper or a website or a publishing house or um, if we're trying to get someone else to publish our works or if we're just publishing it ourselves, then we're printing it off on the printer, we're emailing it to a friend, we're posting it to our Facebook, we're tweeting it, right? Publishing just means to share, right? You're done with it. You know, you're sharing it. That's when you share what is ready or share what is finished. And you might come back and change it later, but for now, it's done. You're going to share what's finished, right? And that's how you do it. So you email me. You take a photo of your work and send it on Facebook Messenger. And you can also talk to your DC to find other ways of getting your work submitted. And once again, I'll put a plug in there for the Adobe Scan app. Really recommend you give that a shot. Get your work to me. Send it over my way. That's the publication phase, okay? Now, at the end of Unit uh, 1, Lesson 2, you will see a reading log for OLC 4.0. So I want you to fill in as much detail as you can for, th for this reading log. I want, you to, I want you to fill that in right now, okay? And get as much detail as you can. And I'm going to put, I'm going to look it up on my phone. So right now I'm listening to an audio book, and I, and I listened to it last night. So I'm going to say, for me, it was November 23rd, and it was an audio book. So I'm listening to an audio book, and it's, I'm just pulling up the title, make sure I got it. Yeah, there it is. It's an audio book. It's called Brain Bugs. Really cool book. So it's called Brain Bugs, How the Brain's Flaws Shape Our Lives. And I listened to it for about uh, one hour last night. Not sure how many pages that is, but it was about uh, one chapter. I don't know how many pages it is because it doesn't, doesn't tell me. But it's probably, I think it was about one chapter of the book. And the main idea or, or comment that I want to make about um, the, the brain bugs that, that I was listening to is I'm just going to pull up my, uh, my chapter here. So let's see our table of contents. Um, okay, so yeah, it was about memories and um, how they can be unreliable. The author was talking about eyewitness testimony and how like sometimes people can, they can have a memory of something and if you put them in front of a police officer or you made them do a lie detector test, they would pass it and in their minds the memory is true but in reality, it's not. So sometimes our memories are false. And sometimes we create memories that aren't real. And sometimes we like to change the past because we don't like it. <laughs> and, we, and we want a different version, right? So that, that was kind of cool, right? So I read that. Um, and then the day before that, November 22nd, I read a, um, I'm just going to say a website article and this was nhl.com that's where I read it um, the length of time was only five minutes but that's okay I spent about five minutes reading it 
and it was probably, I'll just say it was only a page long. And it was about my favorite team, the, uh, the Montreal Canadiens. And it was about how they have, ha um, the article was about too many, too many defensemen on the team. They've got too many defense, which is a good problem to have, and they're, and they're trying to figure out how to use them, right? So, so that's what I want you to do. That, that's just how you fill it out. It's point form. You, you don't have a lot of room to, to write stuff, but you just, when did, when did you read it? What type of text did you read? Um, what's the title? If you, if you can find the author. Um, so I could probably fill in the author there um, for this, for that Brain Bugs book. I'm just looking it up. It's this guy named Dean, something very Italian or Spanish. Buno Mano. I don't know who the author was here. I'll have to look it up. But... Yeah, so that, that, that's how that's done, okay? That's, that's how you do your reading log. And fill in as much stuff as you can. And make note of what you're reading. And it doesn't matter what you're reading as long as you're reading it. And just as long as you can write down as much information about it as you can. All right, so let's pull up unit one. Okay. We've only got eight minutes, but that's okay. That's all we really need. Let's share that. Okay. So we're just going to look at unit one. Okay. So let's see. Let's change that view so we can get the whole thing. Uh, 75%. Don't like that. I'm going to go with... Yeah, that's good enough. 100%. Uh, view full screen. Oh, whoops. Ah, well. So can I zoom out? Okay. So... So we, we talked about, you know, lesson one. It's 80 marks in total. And the first assignment was the Seven Grandfathers Teaching. And if you go back to my YouTube videos, I do give you some tips to go through this um, to tell you how to complete these writing assignments. And I want you to use that five-step writing process. You'll notice that assignment one references the novel Jimmy Comes Home. So it's important that you start reading the novel Jimmy Comes Home even just get the first chapter out of the way. You don't need to talk about the novel in assignment one. It's just, if, if you can bring in it, if you can talk about the novel in the first assignment, that's great, but you don't have to. What you do have to do is to talk about, and here's the important part of the uh, assignment, is you're writing a half page of writing so that, you know, and that should be at least 100 words, maybe 150 words, a half page of writing. And then I, I, I strongly recommend you don't talk about all seven of these grandfather teachings. I'd like you to touch upon one or two of them. So pick respect, pick honesty. You know, like look, that, 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 that is step one of the writing process. When you're planning, you're going to look at one of these seven grandfather teachings and which one of them or two of them can you talk about the most and if you look at that list and you pick your favorite one or two then that's probably going to be the ones you can talk about the most now really important is you are doing a rough copy and you're doing a final copy i need to see both for a total of 20 marks okay you've got to give me your rough copy and you got to give me your final copy Rough copies are intended to be rough, okay? I want you to write in full sentences. You might have a bit of point form, but I want you to write in complete sentences. And I'm not going to mark on grammar 
and punctuation and spelling because as I've discussed in this course, rough copies are meant to be rough and they're meant to just generate ideas, okay? I just want to see that you can generate ideas. Your final copy is when I will mark for grammar and punctuation and spelling, okay? And I want to see a change. I want to see a change from rough copy to final copy. I want to see how you've done some thinking. I want to see how you've been editing your own work, right? Because that's where, that's how we learn to become better writers. Writers are editors, okay? So we don't just simply sit down at our desk, at our computer, with, with a pen and a pad and just start spitting out magic. That's not the way the world works. That's, there's no writer in the world who ever does that. Um, they all put in the work, and the work is the editing. It's, it's making stuff better, sentence by sentence, word by word. That's how you become a better writer, okay? So show me your rough copy, show me your rough ideas, and then show me how you made those ideas better, how you made them sparkle. Yesterday, I put up a quote by Leo Tolstoy, and he said that, that the truth is sort of like panning for gold, and that we find the truth by taking away everything that's not the truth. So, and, it, and, it, and it's not that your rough ideas aren't true or they're not like real, but you're trying to find what you really want to say, right? What's really inside your mind. You know, what are you really trying to say? And sometimes we don't know what we want to say. And we actually learn what we want to say by saying it, by talking and talking and talking and, and just piling up word after word after word. And then we look at it and we're like, okay, um, I'm on to something here. This part doesn't make sense. What was I thinking over here? Oh, this part's really cool. I need to expand that. So, um, yeah, so just stuff like that, right? So, and then, you know, we, we've got this list of commonly misspelled words. They are, they are spelled correctly here. So have a look at those words. Make sure that you know how to spell those words correctly and that's the spelling that makes sense to you okay um, if you go through the course material you'll see some grammar lessons like nouns verbs talking about you know uh, this this is a great explanation about how we write using complete sentences the the parts of speech are are listed in your course material and we've, of course, talked about those extensively. I love talking about the parts of speech. I'm a, I'm a grammar nerd. I love talking about it. But it's really important that you talk about it, too, and, and learn what things are. And, and then, of course, we have the second writing assignment, which is assignment number two, growing up in my community. And if you go back to the YouTube videos, I do give you um, some tips on how to approach that assignment. Same idea, rough, final, 20 marks total. When you're talking about growing up in your community, be specific. Give me tons of detail. I want to I want to see details. Okay. Assignment three, really important. You have to you have to choose every one of these. So, one to five learning skills. One to five instructions. One to five listening. One to five conversational. Every one of these needs to be checked off. And that's all you have to do when you get 10 marks. That's the easiest 10 marks you're going to get in this whole course. Temperament, same goes. Do you have high energy or quiet energy? Do you talk more? Do you listen more? You have to choose one. And then count them up. And whatever, whatever side has more, that's what you are. And you pick it. I'm an introvert. I'm an extrovert. Okay? And that's how that works. And then, of course, we have rubrics for these. Th so, and that's how I'm going to mark it. That's going to give you some idea on how I'm going to make my, my mark on your, on your assignment, right? So, you know, you, you need to strive for level four. That's what you're going for, right? So look at level four and be like, that's what I want to do. And look at level one and be like, that's what I want to avoid doing. And then, of course, we have our um, 
our reading strategies, what we do before we read, what we do after we read. And I've gone over this in a lot of detail in, in these uh, YouTube videos, so go back and look at them. We don't have any time left in today's lecture, but um, all of this was covered in, in, in extensive detail in my YouTube video. I probably covered this stuff more than I covered anything else in the, in the material. And of course, we talked about the journal entry in, in extensive detail and you know fill out that reading log and then next week we're going to jump ahead and we're going to dive into lesson three different types of reading and writing and i look forward to doing that and i will see you all next week have a great weekend